on June 2nd, 2013, the World Academy partnered with the United Nations office in Geneva to conduct a major international conference on what we called the need for a new paradigm in human development. There were over 200 diplomats, leaders of NGOs, business, and other, and governments coming together to discuss the major challenges confronting humanity today. The problems of governance, politics, international security, economic development, employment, inequality, social unrest, instability, immigration, migration, ten cultural tensions, and of course, ecological challenges. And in the course of the conference, we had a special session on education, where the view was powerfully expressed, and I believe it resonated with the audience, that if we want to address any of these issues effectively, and most especially if we have any hope of addressing all of them with all their complexity, their interaction, that education is the single most important issue that we have to effectively address. And it was this discussion, at this discussion, we raised a question to the audience. If you were going to create a global system of education that would provide world-class, I mean top quality education to every young person who seeks it and aspires for it, to make it accessible, to make it affordable, we asked, how would you do it? And there was a dumb silence in the room for a simple reason, we don't know how. And it was that which prompted us to conduct the first meeting at the UC Berkeley, my alma mater, six months later, and ask this question to a top group of educators from five continents. And since then, we have been repeating this question and this discussion and learning through each of these dialogues what we think are key components, key elements of this. But the one thing that everybody agreed on was, even if we can't envision that perfect system, everybody agrees it's not the system we have now. It's not the system that's going to make incremental improvements in these very challenging times. Without the system we have now, without all of the organizations in this room, there's no way we can move forward. But if you look at the statistics, the projections of UNESCO, I think one of the studies they did about five years ago suggested that we would have to create a new university of the size of Harvard, if not the quality, every day of the week, or five days a week for the next 15 years, even to meet just the quantitative demands of the young generation. And I think all of us know that that quantitative statistic of getting enrollment up is only the first part of the challenge and not the end. So our conception in organizing this conference and the others that we are undertaking is to try to look deeper into this, not just the important changes, the problems you're grappling with as educators every day, financial challenges, meeting the enrollment challenges, the enormous number of talented, educated aspire, youth who are turned away by our system, who don't get the opportunity, the shortage of teachers which was referred to and the need for constantly updating them. All of these are real, tangible, important, uh, challenging problems. But we think we need to go beyond. We need to look beyond that if we're really going to find the answer that we need. 
And those are many of the topics that we'll be discussing. With greatest respect and honor for all of those who have dedicated their lives to this profession, we have to look critically and honestly about and think of ways to do it better. Fundamentally, the system we have in place today does not differ too much from the original university founded at Bologna in 1077, at a time 500 years before the printing press, when books were so precious and rare that they were chained to the shelves in the library so nobody should take one. Uh, today, books are prevalent everywhere. We've got all of the media developments since then. We each have more information at our fingertips all the time than anybody, anybody in the world had 25 years ago. And yet, our approach to education hasn't changed that much. Oh, there have been innovations. We use a lot more technology. But fundamentally, we have a system where people who have the knowledge are delivering it uh, through a broadcasting system to those who don't. And from what we know and all the research that's been done on education by fine researchers around the world, there's got to be a better way. Some of you may be familiar with the learning pyramid that was developed by the uh, main laboratory some 40, 50 years ago, in which it showed that the, the level of retention from our lectures, from oral transmission, uh, ranges somewhere between 5 and 10 percent. And if we add to that some discussion groups, it may go up to 20 or 25 percent. And if we have some project-based work, it may go up even to 50 percent retention. But the maximum retention levels are achieved when we teach others. And all of us who are educators know we learn a lot every time we try to share our knowledge with others. So essentially, we have a system that's maximizing the, the learning of the educators. Is there a way we can flip the model? I come from Napa, California. Some 30 years, 25 years ago, the city of Napa decided it wanted to become part of Silicon Valley. That's very ambitious. We're on the northern tip of the San Francisco Bay, far away from Santa Clara, San Jose, Cupertino, where it all started. And so we called together some 20, 25 leading high-tech companies and asked them, what should we be doing differently? What can we be doing more to prepare our youth so that you would like to move up here and uh, take advantage of the, the, the youth in this area. And they gave a wonderful list of practical uh, suggestions. But the first on their list was, you're training students, you're, you're teaching students for 12 plus years to learn by themselves and compete with one another. Whereas, once they come into the company, they almost never do anything alone. And the most important thing they need to know is how to work with others, cooperate with others, exchange, share, communicate with others. So Napa flipped the model. Instead of having teachers, the teachers became facilitators. And instead of the students listening passively to what's coming from an instructor, they were teaching each other. They introduced peer-to-peer -peer learning, small groups of students learning and exchanging their ideas. Today, some 20 years after it really got started, there's more than 120 school districts in the US which are experimenting with these new methods. Schools for the 21st century. And I'm sure there are many experiments going on here as we see in other countries. And I'm only giving this not as a remedy and a solution to all our challenges, but to indicate we really need to think, to rethink the model. And at a time, the fourth revolution, industrial revolution has been mentioned by several of the speakers. At a time when information is changing so fast, when we have so much information that nobody can retain all of it, nobody can become an expert in all of this. 
Is that really the goal of education anymore that it was a thousand years ago to have the information? What we really need are students who learn how to learn and will continue to learn throughout their life because whatever we teach them today, it's going to be out of date in a few years. It's going to be old knowledge. More than memorizing facts and giving yes or no answers, true or false answers, or multiple choice answers, we all know today the truth is not a yes or no or a multiple choice answer. Reality is much more complex than that. The truth has so many dimensions that it doesn't lend itself to standardized testing. So more than finding out whether our students know the truth, whatever that means or uh, of, at a particular time, we need students who can think from multiple dimensions, who can think and analyze problems independently, not memorize the theories of our great theorists in the past, but think freshly, look at life situations in their context, and evolve new solutions, come up with their own perspectives. Learn from everybody who has thought about it, yes, but not be limited to anybody to repeating and parroting back what somebody has said about it in the past. And then we have the problem that our life is so interconnected today, so complex, that the division of reality and I'm particularly talking in the social sciences, which are concerned with trying to understand our life as human beings in a human community. No discipline can reflect the truth or reality of our life today unless it takes into account and looks at the perspective of all the other disciplines. We have an international working group working on new economic theory. Half the members of the group are not even economists. They're lawyers, psychologists, sociologists, anthropologists, business management experts, political scientists. And we're trying to see our economy is embedded in a much more complex environment. And if we want to understand it today, we have to appreciate all the different perspectives. We can't any longer think of preparing students to be experts in very narrow disciplines. Because when we do that, we get them divorced from the real world context in which we live and work. This is not to fault anybody. I say, even today, I would say, this is the greatest institution we have. But it's not enough. We've got to ask ourselves how we go forward. We've got to ask ourselves how we not only invent, but reinvent it and find ways to shift the balance. Our technology has shifted. Everything, our whole way of life has changed. Methods of education, the content of education, the purpose of education needs to change. One of our colleagues, Alberto Zucconi, is going to talk to us about a person-centered education. How do we shift the focus? After all, the purpose is not to produce an engineer or a doctor or a lawyer. It's a human being who's got to thrive, accomplish, and be a successful citizen in the 21st century. What is that person? How much of the person are we really addressing in our education? How do we overcome the disciplinary silos? How do we overcome the gap between the proverbial ivory tower that education at least is accused of being and the real world of which we're going to send our youth out to. These are very challenging problems. Alberto and I are counseling a vocational business college in uh, India, South India, where they're preparing youth for jobs in the logistics and supply chain management uh, industry. And we have found, we are experimenting with ways to completely flip the model. That students, instead of learning something that seems to be abstract and unconnected with their lives, uh, that is really uh, learning from what they already know, from the experience they already have, learning how to enrich that knowledge and make them more effective citizens.